We are concluding our series this morning on contagious faith, and we're looking at a passage that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. It's the letter called Colossians, and we are in the fourth chapter. It's the scriptures in your notes as well as on the screen. And he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always. Can everybody just say always? Always, always full of grace seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Uh, I occasionally have to fly for work-related things, and uh, people often complain that after they fly, they get sick. They caught a bug of some sort while they were on the plane. I'm told that there's some tricks to this. For example, they tell me that if you keep the air vent on you, it helps blow at least some of the germs away. Even if it's cold, it's better to be cold than to get sick. And they also suggest sitting next to the window because at least you're reducing by half the number of people who can contaminate you. And they suggest not sitting next to the aisle because the person who's rushing back to the bathroom with whatever sickness it is that they have, you don't want to catch that as they go by. You're probably sitting here this, wondering, this morning wondering why I'm giving you travel tips for air travel. And what I want you to know is that Paul is actually writing this letter from a prison. He's actually in chains as he writes it. And he's not worried about catching something. He's focused on spreading something. It really is quite a different approach. And so he's writing a letter to a group of believers who are in a city called Colossae. And in that group of people, they've come to know Christ. They're followers of Christ. But they seem to be fascinated with some things. For example, anyone who has a story about an angel or a demon, they're all in. Like they will listen to for hours to stories like that. And on top of that, they also have lots of rules. They like rules. It makes them feel like they're making progress. And particularly, they had lots of rules about diet. They thought that what you put into your body in terms of calories actually helped improve you spiritually. How many are glad that we do not follow the Colossian diet around here? The challenge was not that they had signed on to false doctrine. It's that they become kind of tempted to give attention to lesser things. They were easily put into kind of a side trail. And Paul says, uh, we need to correct some of this. We need to come back to the things that really matter. And what he tells them to do, how he corrects this surprises me. It's not the advice I would have given. The advice I would have given would be, well, just go back and study the major themes of Scripture. Just do that. But what I have noticed is, is that there are people who can go to Scripture and pull out a lot of trivial pursuits. So I'm surprised at the answer that Paul gives, but when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. What he says is, devote yourself to prayer. That If you want to maintain a healthy gravitational pull to the things that really matter, devote yourself to prayer. And uh, the, the challenge for us is, is when we pray... If we're going to devote ourselves, what does that mean? And it means, first of all, that you pray, that you pray often, that you pray about a lot of things, that you pray when you are alone, that you pray when you are with other people. And the good news is, is that everyone at some point in their life prays. There's no such thing as a person who, under the right circumstances, didn't follow an internal instinct to turn their heart towards heaven and begin a conversation, even if they had no idea who that they were talking to. Everybody prays at some point. Lots of people pray frequently or even every day. In fact, they've done surveys. You're probably not surprised. What, what kind of things do people pray about? And 82% of people who pray daily say that they pray for their family and their friends. That's a good thing. 74% of people who pray daily say that they also pray about personal problems. Pray about personal problems. Let's just do our own poll today. How many have ever prayed about a personal problem? Don't raise your hand. How many of your personal problems were actually your family or your friends? Because that's like <laughs> killing two birds with one stone there. 
54% said that they prayed about good things that they were thankful for. Something good had happened in their life, and they just wanted to express gratitude to God. 42% said that they prayed about personal sin. They were asking forgiveness because they realized that they'd crossed some moral, ethical boundary, and they felt like they violated something and they wanted to be forgiven. And then 38% said that they actually pray uh, related to disasters or uh, horrific circumstances that occur. And it just feels like lately there's too many of those on the news. Always have something to pray about that way. I also think that when we pray, we tend to ask questions. For example, if you're going through a difficult season in your life, you, you just tend to be a person. So why is this happening to me? Uh, there seems to be uh, something unresolved, like... Some stuff, we figure out why it's happening to us. Other stuff, it just seems to catch us by surprise. Or we might ask, how can I avoid pain and suffering? Because a lot of our decisions are based on that. Or we might ask, how can I fix a problem that I'm actually struggling with? Or we might ask, what's the right decision to make? You know, what school should I go to? What neighborhood should I live in? What person should I marry? I had a person come to me one time, and they said they wanted... They wanted me to answer a question. I said, well, what's the question? They said, is it God's will for me to be married to? And they, they named a person. And uh, I don't know why I asked this question back, but I did. And I said, well, are you, are you currently married to them? And they said they were. I said, then that is God's will for you. <laughs> it's just some people come up with trick questions. You know, we like to know what's going to happen next. You know, we have lots of questions. And they're all good questions. And I think it's healthy to bring our concerns and our questions to God and ask him for his assistance and his direction. All of that is helpful. But there's another question that we might not be as interested in asking or as intentional about asking. And I think it's a really big deal. I think this question will change faith from being something that you think to an adventure that you live. And the question is, what do you want me to do? That's a game-changing question. Because we often ask God to do stuff for us, but it has ever occurred to us, he might ask us to do something for him. So when we, when we approach God just to start with that concept, or at least include it, it's astonishing if you dare to ask God that question, what will come to your mind within the next few minutes? And we would be really wise to pay attention to that, because God is showing us something. So what Paul begins to help us understand is that our faith becomes contagious when we pray. When we pray. That the only way for our faith to be contagious is if we are in regular contact with the object of our faith. So we want our faith to spread. We, we want other people to be exposed to the grace of God. And any person who prays with any level of consistency in their life begins to be influenced by the motivations and the agenda of God. You, you just can't help it. When you are around the presence of God, you tend to be influenced by him. And one of the things that you discover is how much God loves people. It is unbelievable how much God loves people. In fact, the most famous and most memorized and most quoted verse in all of the Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for us. And here's the thing. God still loves people. His passion is not reduced by even a tiny little bit. The thought of being separated from people that he loves for eternity is unthinkable and unacceptable to him. And that's why he's gone to the incredible lengths he has to help us never to have to experience that. Now, people who pray regularly start caring about what God cares about. And God wants every single person, yes, even the people you don't get along with, even the people you would like to avoid, God still wants them to experience his grace. So regular prayer kind of sensitizes you to some things. Now, there's some things we would rather be numb to. For example, I am not a fan of needles. Does anyone else here not care about needles? Just a few of you. Interestingly enough, most of you are sitting in the back. That's a, <laughs> I don't know why that's true, but... Maybe the needle people up front don't want to raise their hands. That could be. So I went in for a procedure one time, and they had to put in an IV, and they did something that I'd never had done before. They put something on my hand that numbed my hand so I didn't feel the needle when it went in. I thought that was a brilliant idea. 
I still didn't like the needle, but at least I didn't have to feel it. If I looked away, I wouldn't know what they were doing. Well, they tried, and they were not able to get the IV in the location, so they had to go to another place on the arm. And they took their needle, and they went to put it in, and I said, hey, hey, wait, wait, where's the numbing stuff? <laughs> and they looked at me like I was the biggest baby on the planet. <laughs> and I didn't care. I wanted the numbing stuff. There are lots of things that we want to be numb to, but prayer sensitizes us to things. For example, we become sensitive to the nearness of God. I can almost guarantee that if you sense that there's, or if you feel like there's a distance from God, it is not because he's not present. It's just because we've become less sensitive to that. And prayer kind of heightens that sensitivity. Prayer also helps sensitize us to what our next steps should be. We, we seem to gain at least some clarity when we pray. So Paul begins to pray for doors to open so that he can share the good news about God's heart for people and the work that he has done for them. So Paul tells us, pray for open doors. Pray for open doors. Now here's what we need to know about this. Only God can open doors. See, we want to kick the doors down. We want to overwhelm and overpower people so that they will surrender their hearts and their minds to the grace of God. And it's not how it works. You can't cram Christ through closed doors. It doesn't work. You can't manipulate and intimidate people into faith. Only God can do a work in a person's heart and in a person's mind so that now the next conversation winds up being really significant. So pray for open doors. Now to walk through an open door when it is available to you, you need to be clear. And this is challenging for us because a lot of us want to be captivating or we want to be clever. We want to appear to be knowledgeable. We want, we want to appear to be an expert in issues of doctrine and theology. We want to kind of reveal our depth, and that's not the goal of those conversations. Paul says, pray for clarity. And then Paul says, we also need to pray for wisdom, to be wise. Don't be an unwise person. Obnoxious language... Make, that makes you sound superior doesn't attract anyone to God. It distracts them. We, we had a person one time come in and, and speak in our church. They were a guest speaker. And they, you know what? They, they came up, and the first thing they said when they got behind the, the, the table here, they said, I know what the letters bills stand for, for the Buffalo Bills. And so I'm just sitting there a little bit apprehensive. And he said, it stands for, boy, I love losing Super Bowls. <laughs> He's a heretic. <laughs> what is he thinking? So the truth is he's not a heretic, but the truth is if you're a Bills fan, it's going to be hard to hear the next thing he says. It's astonishing how often we don't realize that if we are wise with our words, we can actually help ourselves when we're walking through one of those doors that God has opened. Wisdom requires that you actually listen to what a person is saying. How many have ever had the experience when you said something and then when the person talked back, it was obvious they did not hear a word you said? Anybody ever had that experience? Come on, how many married people do we have in the room today? If you're married, you've had that experience. Wisdom requires you to listen. Wisdom requires you to be sensitive. Wisdom makes God the hero of your story, not yourself. It's amazing how many of our spiritual stories make it sound like we were sick and tired of being sick and tired, and then we picked ourselves up by our bootstraps, and we made ourselves into something. That does not attract people to God. By the way, it won't attract them much to you either. Make God the hero of your story. He's the one who initiated grace in our lives. So if we're going to be clear, what should we be clear about? There's three basic things we need to be clear about. And the first is this, is that God is better than you think he is. God is actually better than you think he is. He loves you. It's his only motivation. He isn't against you. He's not out to get you. He's not embarrassed by you. He's not ashamed of you. He actually loves you. That's what's true about God. Now, I know that God gets a bad reputation because every bad thing that happens in our world, he gets blamed for. If it's a natural disaster, it's called an act of God. And if it's an unnatural disaster, people will say, well, at least if God was really as good and powerful as he says he is, why couldn't he keep it from happening? And it's because people don't understand how broken our world actually is, and they don't understand what happens when people exercise their own free will. 
Bad things happen to good people when people make decisions to do things like that. So there'll always be people who want to define God. And even in, in religious circles, there are people who will try to paint God as being good up to a point. And then you're going to tick him off, and then he's going to be done with you. And what you should know is that when people paint God that way, they're not trying to get you to God. They're trying to get you to obey what their preferences are. And that's a problem. People are not actually attracted to God when we paint him to be something other than he is. So only the gospel reveals who God really is. And only a personal experience of the gospel helps us experience that for ourselves. So God is actually better than we ever hoped or dreamed he could be. Here's the second thing we need to be clear about. You or we are worse than we think we are. We are worse than we think we are. So here's what I'd like you to do. You're going to need to smile when you do this, but just look at the person next to you and tell them you are a hot mess. Just go ahead and tell them that, okay? Now, you are saying a lot more than what I told you to say. <laughs> Some of you are making your case and proving your point. And I did not ask you to do that. You see, no rational person claims to be perfect. The problem is, is that we can always think of someone else that we are doing at least a little bit better than. There are lots of people, you just make better choices than they do. It's true. And uh, we don't know what drives their choices, and we're not altogether sure why you tended to make better ones, but the idea that I tend to make better choices than some people, to equate that with I'm perfect, uh, that's not a rational position to hold. In fact, I would give you an experiment. You don't even have to ask God this. You can ask yourself this. Just ask yourself. Find a quiet place somewhere. Take five minutes. Find a quiet place and ask yourself, what are some areas in my life I could improve on? And you will not be able to write fast enough to keep up with it. It's just true. We know this about ourselves, all right? So here's the challenge. Every single mistake, every single misstep, whether we did it on purpose or accidentally, it all creates this kind of debt, this cosmic indebtedness. And and someone says, well, I don't, I don't believe that's true. Well, just think about it. For example, if you tell a lie, and I would ask you how many of you told a lie, and some people would be honest and some people would be not, and then I'd be causing them to sin by telling another lie. So I try not to make a sin while we're here. But when you tell a lie, there's a cost associated with that. There's a debt that gets created when we do that. Trust gets broken. There are people who actually believe something we said and they act on those words and then they wind up being disappointed or even wounded. And on top of that, not only do they become less trusting, but we become less credible. And we might even carry this little residue of guilt for failing to have the courage to speak the truth when the opportunity came. We just kind of bailed on it. Or how about when we're acting selfishly? We're not trying to do what's best for everyone or even for someone else. We just want what's best for ourselves. When we say what we need to say in order to get what we really want, we don't use words for communication. We use them for control. We use them as tools to be able to get us what we want. And if that's ever been done to you, you know how painful that that can be. And you tend to create distance between yourselves and people like that because you know they're just going to get what you have at your expense. And if you do that to somebody else, they'll, they'll react the same way to you. And we can pretend like that debt doesn't exist, but that doesn't make it go away. It actually causes pain in other people's lives and creates distance. And here's the thing. That is that in that indebtedness, that is just two areas of the infinite number of ways that we can fall short of God's glory or bring sin into our own lives. And here, we can pretend like, okay, I'm going to pay my own debt. Okay? That's a noble idea, and there's actually lots of people who try to do that. But how long do you think it will take to go back and find every single mistake and misstep and all of the damage that it did 
and not only seek to ask forgiveness, but actually rebuild whatever trust was necessary. How long do you think it would take for every one of those incidences? And then ask yourself, how long do you think you have left to live? Do you think you can do this in your lifetime? On top of that, it's not just an asking forgiveness thing, but to rebuild that trust requires a kind of goodness that honestly we don't have in sufficient qualities and quantities. Our goodness is often a little bit contaminated and our goodness is often in short supply. We just don't have enough time or enough goodness. That's why the good news is such good news. God has provided payment for all of our sins. His perfection was good enough. And he's the one that keeps track of the debt. And if he says the debt is paid in full, then it is. Jesus paid that debt in full. And it's already done. It's not like there's something you have to do. That's good advice. It's something he's already done. That's what makes it good news. So we need to understand that we are actually worse than we think we are. And the third point to be clear on is that every single one of us has to decide for ourselves. I know there are some people who wish that the grace of God were just kind of an automatic thing. Kind of like sin is. You know, sin is automatic. We're, all, we're kind of corrupted with a sinful capacity. And eventually we will do it whether we want to or not. And so we're, that's just what's true about it. So why can't grace be like that, this automatic thing? But here's what you need to know. That grace is not automatic. And it would not, God would not be honoring to us to impose grace on us. He doesn't force us to accept what he has to offer. What he does is he offers it freely. It cost him greatly, but he's willing to give it to us freely. He won't force us into that position. Only we can make that decision for ourselves. Now, the idea of grace is God's idea. He's the one who acted, but we are the one who will react. We will respond, and we can either accept and receive that, or we can reject and decline that offer. But he's the one who acts. Here's the challenge with paying down your own debt option. If you go that route, and maybe you're a pretty good rule keeper, here's the challenge though. You'll always wonder and you'll always worry if you're good enough, whatever that threshold line is. Am I good enough? And God didn't want us spending our entire lives wondering and worrying if we measured up. So he sent his son who measured up in every way because he didn't want us to live a fearful life filled full of anxiety, wondering if we're good enough. Now, how do you know if this gospel is working in you? If you've kind of accepted this, how do you know this is working? And there's a couple things. One is you begin to understand that God redeems you and your experiences. God redeems you and your experiences. Last week, we spent quite a bit of time talking about how the Apostle Paul was a persecutor of those who were followers of Jesus. But this is fascinating. God uses the very knowledge that he had of scriptures that he used to persecute and terrorize people. He uses that same knowledge of scriptures now to expand the grace of God and to promote Jesus Christ. So same studies. I mean, he studied the same scriptures. It's the same scriptures, but now he sees them differently. Or how about his education? He had a phenomenal education, one of the highest educated people in his day. And God used that education in order to further the gospel. He used his citizenship in Rome as a leverage point to further the gospel. Uh, the Apostle Paul was a, a linguist. He, he actually could speak at least five languages fluently that we know from Scripture. So at least five languages fluently. And God used that to expand the gospel. But here's the challenge. We can come to believe that God can only use our successes as a point of redemption. And here's what I want you to know. The gospel tells us that not can only God use the good things of our lives, but it can actually redeem the bad things of our life, our weaknesses, our failures, the stories we're embarrassed about. He can use them to do amazing things with them. God doesn't just redeem you. He redeems your experiences. When you've been through a difficult season, your survival in that season actually gives hope to others because they've been wondering if they can get through this. See, God doesn't just rescue us. He redeems us. He's the ultimate recycler. He can take everything that has been part of our lives and bring good 
through it. Now, he's so good at it, some people think that he actually causes the bad things in our lives. That's not what the position of Scripture teaches. God does not cause the pain in our lives, but whatever has happened in our lives, God can redeem it. Another evidence that you've been uh, touched by the uh, gospel and, and it's transforming your life is that you become more respectful of others and the work that God is doing in their lives. See, Paul had been pretty brutal with those who uh, stood against him and followed Jesus. Before he became a Christian, he felt pretty comfortable in being very harsh with those who disagreed with him. He believed that faith was all about knowing the right rules and obeying the right rules. The challenge is, is when you are a good rule keeper, you will feel just a little bit superior to other people who are not so good in the rule-keeping department. You tend to become a little intolerant and a little impatient. In fact, some people think that if you're a Christian, that makes you a better person or a better parent or a better spouse or a better employee. Please listen to me. You might live next door to a person who's never heard a thing about the grace or the goodness of God. They've never read a passage of scripture. They've not made any faith commitments at all. And they could be phenomenally moral and phenomenally good in being a spouse and a parent. This is not about if you're good enough, then grace applies. I'm I am happy to admit to you today that there are lots of people who are better spouses and better parents and better pastors than I am, and I'm very glad to admit to you today that my getting better than them was not required to be acceptable to God. Does that make any sense? So when we begin to understand this, it helps us see people differently. We don't look down on them. We don't become intolerant of them. We don't become impatient with them. It changes how we treat others. Angry Christians aren't defending their faith. They're defending themselves. That's what they're doing. When you begin to experience the grace of God and it's transforming your life, you see people differently. And you don't become angry about where they are. You become hopeful about what God could do. So our responsibility is simply to bear witness of all that God is doing in our lives. Now, we share our story of how Jesus rescued us and how he's redeeming us, and we live out the power of the gospel with joy that is not the result of just getting stuff or peace that's not the result of just things going our way or, or contentment that's not just about what we're able to obtain and, and acquire, that these gifts are actually things, part of the flow of grace into our lives. And here's what I will tell you. Some people will be attracted to that. And what you should also know is that some people will not be attracted to that. Just because God is doing great things in your life doesn't mean everybody's interested, which takes us back to the very beginning of our talk today. That's why we pray for God to open doors. When God opens a door, the conversation takes on new meaning. Now you're not trying to argue them into the kingdom. You're answering the questions they have. And there's a great deal of difference between arguing and answering. When you experience the power of the gospel and you allow it to transform your life, there are others that will begin to praise God because of you. Let's bow our heads this morning. I think I would like to uh, challenge you today. along with all the things you ask God to help with and all the people you asked to help out, with all the questions that you bring to him, and he's not offended by any of them, I wonder if you could add to that set of questions, what would you like me to do? Who would you like me to connect with? Because I honestly believe if you dare to pray that prayer and ask that question, God will begin to direct you. You don't even have to force it. It's astonishing how often that when he calls someone to your attention, how soon they show up crossing paths in your life. And what you should know is if he called that person to your attention and you cross their paths in your life, 
then maybe he has opened a door in their heart and their mind to be able to respond and receive his grace. And now all you need to be is clear. God is so much better than we ever imagined him to be. And as hard as we try, we're never quite good enough. But if we're willing to accept his gift and make that decision for ourselves, it changes everything. So Father, help us dare to ask that question in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand today.